Hello and welcome to this Friday video. This is Friday number 11. Chapter 10 assignment. It's going to be problem number 5. For a couple of reasons. One, it allows me to point at some interesting things in the book. Two, it allows me to use Excel to show you how you can do this in Excel. Three, it allows me to commiserate with you that sometimes this is very frustrating, especially when the Connect doesn't um, do it the way that one would usually want to do it. And the key on chapter 10 assignment, number 5, is that you're supposed to, according to Connect, round the intermediate calculations to three decimal places. Well, never do that. I don't care what Connect says. Never round your intermediate calculations. Keep as many decimal places as you can. It increases your precision. And as you will come to realize in just a moment, if you're rounding these intermediate calculations to three decimal places, then it makes absolutely no sense to have some confidence that it rolls to four decimal places. That last decimal is going to be a complete junk. So let's begin, see how we can do this in Excel. And here we go. In the book, Essentials of Marketing Research, blah, 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 blah. Results show that 25 out of the 140 homeowners so this is already, we know this is going to be a proportions, because this 25 cannot be greater than 140. This is binomial all the way. Homeowners definitely would, and while 9 out of 60 renters, again, this is going to be a proportion because the 9 is binomially distributed. The 9 can't be greater than 60 or less than 0, would buy the system. So let's get that information in here. Um, let's do XH for homeowners. Um, Number of successes for homeowners is 25. Uh, the number of trials for homeowners is the 140. And again, my numbers may differ from yours. Um, for the renters, we'll call it XR, R for renters. Uh, number of successes is 9. And XN, whoops, that'd be NR, um, 60 renters were talked to. Okay. So we've got two proportions, might as well calculate those proportions. A proportion for homeowners, that's equal to 25 divided by 140. And the proportion of renters, that's going to be equal to 9 divided by 60. Next thing we really should calculate is the pooled proportion. That's the total proportion or the proportion in all of our sample where we ignore renters and homeowners we can just look at the numbers of successes and number of failures. So the number of successes in the pool is just equal to the number of successes for the homeowners plus the number of successes for the renters. And the number of total number of trials in the pool is just going to be equal to the number of trials of homeowners plus of renters which means that PP is going to be equal to 34 divided by 200. So I'm going to highlight those and I'm going to highlight that. And we haven't even looked at the question much. Okay, so letting P1 be the proportion of homeowners. So let's change this from XH to X1 and NH to N1 and pH to P1, and letting P2 be the proportion of renters, so this will be X2, X, N2, and P2. Set up the null and hypo an alternative hypotheses needed to determine whether the proportion of homeowners who would buy significantly differs. It's not saying is greater than, it's not saying is less than, it's saying it's just different which means that the null hypothesis is equal to zero versus the alternative hypothesis of not equal to zero. Again, differs tells us that this is the null and this is the alternative. B, find the test statistic and the p-value. Use the p-value test hypothesis with alpha equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. And then answer the question, how much evidence is there? Okay, we are going to, and this will throw off some of your grades until I go through and actually fill in the grades. 
uh, round the intermediate calculations not to three decimal places. We're not going to round them at all. But we are going to round our z value to 2 and our p value to 3 just so that we can put them in these numbers. Now, before we can calculate the z value, we have to calculate the standard error. And it would be the standard error corresponding to the hypothesis test, which we'll find on in the book at the bottom of page 400. And it's the first one, because d0 is equal to 0. We're saying that p1 minus p2 is equal to 0, and that 0 would be the d0. And so it would be note 1, and there's the standard error. It's the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat times 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. So we'll call this s e for standard error. That's going to be equal to the square root of p hat, and that's what this p pooled is, times 1 minus that pool proportion, times 1 divided by n1 plus 1 divided by n2. There's the standard error. And now we can perform the usual hypothesis test, z. That's going to be equal to the difference in the observed means, p1 minus p2. And we know it's p1 minus p2 because that's how our null hypothesis is written, divided by that standard error. We're going to round that to, where are we? Z to two decimal places. That would be 0 0.49. The p-value. Remember, this is a two-sided test. So if we're looking at the graphics up on, at the bottom of page 400, we're going to look at the, the one on the far right in each of those two little sections. And if you notice, that one on the far right has two tails that are colored in. This, the area of each of those two tails is equal to the other. So all we really have to do is calculate the area of one of those two tails and multiply it by two. And because of the way that the z distribu or the cumulative distribution functions are laid out, we're going to do it on the left tail and double that. So this is going to be equal to 2 times, and again it's 2 times because it's 2 tails, and we're really only calculating the area of 1. dist dot, sorry, it's norm dot dist. The value of x is not z, but if we look at the graphic, it's negative times the absolute value of z. So that's negative z, comma, mean is 0 because it's a standard normal, standard deviation is 1, and true. So there's the correct p-value. Three decimal places, 0.622. That's the p-value. Always compare the p-value to alpha. Always compare the p-value to alpha. We have been given four alpha values, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, that p is greater than all of them. So we're going to, erect, we're going to reject h null at none of those values. We would only reject the null hypothesis if alpha was greater than that p. If we decided for some weird reason we wanted our alpha to be 0.7, then we would reject the null hypothesis but it makes absolutely no sense to have a alpha that high because that alpha is the proportion of the time that we will reject a true null hypothesis and we want to keep that pretty low. If we reject the null hypothesis at no values then we're going to have it that and it will give us no absolutely no evidence scroll to the right a little bit 
and the evidence that P1 and P2 differ, because we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we have no evidence. Now, we would say sum if we reject it at alpha equals 0.1. We would say strong if we reject it at alpha equals 0.05. We would say very strong if we reject it at alpha equals 0.01. And we'd say extremely strong if we rejected it at alpha equals 0 0.001. You might want to rewind and write down that. But since we don't reject it all, there's no evidence. Now we're going to calculate the 95% confidence interval. To calculate the confidence interval, let's go to page 399. Um, at the top. And there's the formula for the confidence interval. Notice something from that formula. The part in the square root, or the square root and the part that's in the square root, is not the standard error that we calculated before. The reason is, when you're doing a p-value, you're using the null hypothesis at some point. When you're doing a confidence interval, it is always based on the data itself, and only the data. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. I won't ha be able to do this. So we'll call this SE2. And this will be the, the square root plus everything that's inside the square root for the confidence interval. So that's equal to the square root. And it's going to be P1 times 1 minus p1 divided by n1 plus p2 times 1 minus p2 divided by n2. And then we got to close up the square root. So that's the standard error for the confidence interval. That's the square root part of the confidence interval. The point estimate is just P1 minus P2. We'll call point estimate PE. This is equal to P1 minus P2. And then the distributional multiplier, well, that's Z of alpha over 2, and it's just going to be 1.96. So the lower confidence limit is going to be equal to that point estimate minus that distributional multiplier times the standard error. And the upper confidence limit, that's going to equal the point estimate minus, uh, I'm sorry, plus the distributional multiplier times the standard error. So the confidence interval is from negative 0 0.08, four places, 1.8, to 0 0.13, I know. Now on the basis of this interval, can we be 95% confident these proportions differ? And the answer is no. 0, which is our d naught, our hypothesized difference, is within this confidence interval, which means that a difference of 0 is reasonable. No. Note that this no and this no should always be the same, or, well, let me take that back. When dealing with means, those should always be the same. When dealing with proportions, they can differ, but it's extremely rare. And there we go. Let's go ahead and submit. Submit anyway. That should be a 10 out of 50. We did everything correctly. The problem is, here, they wanted us to round the intermediate calculations. If we did so, that would have changed it to 0 0.50. And there, if z is 0 0.50, going to the table in the back of the book, we get the p-value of 0 0.6170. The book is wrong, or I'm sorry, connect is wrong. Never round your intermediate calculations. Never. 
So here are some things that we picked up from this problem. One, we looked at how to apply the two formulas, one on page 400, which is for the testing hypotheses of difference of two proportions, and the one on 399, which gives us a confidence interval for the difference. We looked at the difference in the standard errors that are used between those two, popu uh, two formulas. And then we did the calculations in Excel. And we realized that sometimes connect is just wrong. Never, ever round intermediate calculations, if you can help it. Take care of yourself. Have a great day. And I'll be here for you.